Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 633. Today we're gonna to talk about Yellow and Yangtze. Now this is coming from Grail Games, designed by Reiner Knizia. And this is a kind of a spiritual successor to an older uh, Reiner Knizia design called Tigers and Euphrates. This shares a lot in common with that. Now if you've not heard of or played Tigers and Euphrates, I've done a couple uh, videos about it. I'll go ahead and put links to those in the description of the video just to familiarize yourself if you're not familiar. Uh, this ha changes a whole bunch of stuff from Tigers and Euphrates. It's, they're definitely not the same game. You can definitely see sort of the DNA or the lineage or whatever from Tigers to this game, but they're not the same and they don't really play out the same. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to kind of harp on that just for a quick second. There's a lot of stuff that is the same. There's a lot of things like you do this action and do this action. So that's definitely familiar. And it has these kind of conflicts as you're battling uh, and playing tiles out that are similar. Now the setting is different. The Tigris is, and Euphrates is set kind of in uh, Mesopotamia between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Now this here is set in China, the Yellow Yangtze. And it has sort of a similar kind of civilization vibe where in both games you're trying to uh, very abstractly manipulate these sort of different aspects of a civilization, trade, uh, war, uh, farming, and that kind of stuff. Very, very abstract, don't get me wrong. Although in some ways it's still thematic, which is interesting. Uh, but so this is this one's set in China, the other one's set in the Middle East, and uh, the other one is set on sort of hex, or the other one is set on square grid kind of thing, and this one is sort of a hex grid, which doesn't really seem to affect to me the gameplay that much. It's interesting, uh, but you still have somewhat similar kind of spatial uh, considerations. It, it, that part isn't really as big a departure as some of the other mechanics. So enough kind of uh, hemming and hawing around it. Let's jump into this. I'll give you a little bit of an idea how this one works. And then I'll come back here and definitely talk about some of the differences, compare, contrast, and then maybe try to figure out <laughs> which one I like better. Okay, that's enough of a spoiler. Let's jump in. Okay, here I've got the board set up for Yellow and Yangtze. Couple things to note here. We've got these various different colored cubes off to the side. These are your victory points, just like Tigers and Euphrates. The little ones count as one, the big ones count as five. At the end of the game, the least uh, of a color that you have is gonna be your total points. So the main colors are these four colors here. Green, which you can't see on the green background. <laughs> So you have green, black, blue, and red. So if you have 10 of each, then your score is gonna be 10. But let's say you had 10 blue, 10 black, 10 green, and nine red, your score is then nine. Whatever you have the least of, that's your actual score. However, there are also yellows. These yellows count as wild. So you're gonna go ahead and apply these to whatever you're currently lowest in to kind of shore up your score. So it's definitely important to collect these yellow ones. So that's how you win the game. Now players are gonna be placing different tiles. They're gonna have these behind a screen. So if you look here, here there's four screens. So you've got the lions, the bulls, the archers, the vases here, the pottery guys. Uh, so you choose one of these, and this is now your particular side's symbol. And behind this screen, you're gonna have six tiles. And these are gonna be uh, hidden from the other players, obviously. And then in front of your screen, you're gonna have, let's say you were the bowl team, then you're going to have one of each of these different colors. So again, the four scoring colors and then kind of like the wild scoring color. So these would be in front of your screen. On your turn, most of the time you're going to be playing tiles and playing these, just like Tigers and Euphrates. So you keep playing until you run out of tiles out of this bag. So as you do your turn, uh, yourself and anybody else who might have discarded tiles in a battle that you initiated are always going to draw back up to six tiles. Once you have to draw, from this bag and you no longer can because it's empty, immediately is going to end the game. And then again, you're gonna total up everybody's score of the various different cubes that they have. So on your turn, you get two actions. One of the very simple actions is putting out a leader. Now leaders can only be placed next to a black colored tile. Uh, you can see the game comes with black tiles seated in these particular locations to start out. So a very typical opening move might be to play this leader and then play another tile kind of connected to uh, this adjoining city. So as you play along, you might get other tiles here and this becomes 
a sort of a larger and larger city that may eventually, at some point, connect to a different city like that. So bam, that would connect to this city and any other tiles that it had grown and it would become one large city. So before we get too ahead of ourselves, what you're gonna do on your turn, obviously play leader. Optionally, you can pull a leader off the board and put that in front of you, which you might wanna do. You can also move a leader to a different spot. But remember again, it has to be adjacent to a black tile, tile at all times. So that's how leader works. So placing a tile works a little bit differently. You're gonna place this and then you're probably, if you're playing right, going to score that tile. Now, typically, you want to have the same color leader matching that. So if I put, maybe my first turn was put the green guy out and then put the green leader in there. So if I place a tile on my turn that matches the color of one of my leaders in that larger city, then I will then score a victory point of that color. Now, the black leader works a little bit differently, is that he can score for any color. So if I play the black leader and then the green tile in that case, then in that case, I will go ahead and score a green leader unless somebody else's green leader is there. So that will then sort of switch off his sort of wild scoring opportunity. So if I wanted to, in this case, maybe I wouldn't play that green one because he's there, I would play this red one. And because I've got the black leader there, then I would take the red tile, or excuse me, the red victory point. Now, unlike Tigris, these tiles also have some different uh, special abilities. So if, let's just roll this back a little bit. Let's say I had played this green tile here. That's cool. I'm gonna score a green victory point, just like I explained a second ago. But since I played a green tile, I get to then choose from the market because the green tiles are sort of like merchant tiles. So whenever you play a green tile, then you can take and choose one of these tiles, if I take the yellow one, because those are really nice, and those are gonna score me those wild victory points, I can take and then put that behind my screen. So obviously that's much better than drawing blindly out of the bag at the end of the round. Now let's talk about the blue tiles. And then the blue tiles can only go in the water, and they're the only thing that can go in the water. You can't place any other tiles there. You can't place leaders there, even the blue leader. Uh, the blue ones also have a special effect. So let's say I had the blue guy there. Obviously I could play the blue tile and get a blue victory point. But as one of my two actions, I can daisy chain multiple blue tiles if I have them in one play. So for one action, I can go blue, 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 score three blue victory points and away I go. So that's the special ability of the blue versus the green, which goes and lets me get a tile from the market. Now, obviously the yellow tiles are just special anyway, because if I play this and I have either the yellow leader there or maybe the black leader there, then I can get a yellow victory point. And obviously those are great because those can be applied to any color victory point. Now there's another neat little aspect here. And let's say I had, instead of going this way, I decided to play, let's say I had this guy here, blue tiles going in this direction. So I could go blue, blue, blue. So these are all contiguously adjacent to the previous tile. And every time you get a triangle like that, you can if you want, and usually you always want to, take a pagoda of the matching color and stick it there. So now, at the end of every one of my turns, if I have the matching leader, in this case the black leader won't count for this ability I'm going to talk about, but if I have the matching leader to that pagoda, I'm going to just automatically generate that color victory point every turn. So this is going to start pumping out blues to the point where I have so many blues I don't care about blues anymore, probably, unless somebody takes this from me. And you can do that for the other different uh, pagodas as well. So if we scooch over here a little bit, and let's say I had built this one here like that. And so then, oh, hey, guess what? I can build a green one. And if I've got my green leader connected to this uh, city state, then this is gonna start pumping out green victory points every turn. Now, if we look here at the top of the board, you can see there's two of each of these, except for there's only the one yellow. If, let's say both of these green ones had been placed on the board, and then somebody else had built a second, uh, or excuse me, a third green triangle, then you can move uh, one of the pagodas off of the other one and then move it to the new one as well. So even though they're eaten up, they're not completely lost, and the pagodas will be jumping around uh, quite frequently during the course of the game. Now here's another interesting situation. Uh, one of the things that you can do, you can do a couple different things with the blue and green tiles as well. So if I had two blue tiles here behind my screen, for one of my actions, I can take and discard two of these blue tiles, throw them out of the game, and then just pick a tile here and delete it and knock it off the board, any tile I want. Now in this case, 
it's opportune because this is now going to disable uh, that from being a legal spot for this to be. So this is going to pop off the board. So you can do that. You might also delete maybe a spot where there's a black tile and that's going to make the leader placement invalid or maybe sever some connection or something. So that is called the uh, peasant's uh, riot. So now another sort of counterbalance to that is maybe somebody else or myself on a later turn can discard two green tiles and then I can take and then create a pagoda where one could legally be. Because in this situation, uh, we've got sort of a legal spot, but because of sort of the occurrence of the events, there's no pagoda there. So I can take and discard two and then move that back there. Now you can also do these actions. So there's a certain case where instead of discarding two blues to blow up a tile or two greens to move a pagoda, you can discard one. And that's if you have the matching colored leader behind your screen. You can sort of effectively apply that as one of the tiles. And so I can, in that case, just discard one blue tile to nuke a spot. But again, this leader has to be off the board in front of you. And a similar idea goes here with the green to move the pagoda. If this guy's in front, off the board in front of me, then I can just discard one green tile. So that's all the kind of the different actions. Again, you can also discard tiles behind your screen as many as you want, and then draw back up to six for one action. And of course, that's a way that you can sort of end the game quick if you wish, if you think you're winning, to sort of deplete the bag and get to the bottom of the bag and end the game faster. So let's talk about the conflicts, which work kind of the same and a little bit different than Tigris. So there's two types of conflict. So let's say we had this sole kind of autonomous city-state all here on, on its lonesome. We've got a blue leader in there. And then the uh, crossbow guys come in here like a bunch of jerks, and they place their blue leader in there. Now we can't have that. You can never have the same colored leader in a, a uh, city. You can't have it. So at that point, this guy's initiating a conflict. So when we're doing this kind of internal conflict where we're having it triggered based on a leader placement, then we're going to be concerned with the black tiles. So in this case, you're gonna look at the black tiles adjacent to your leader. So me as the defending bull player, I've got one, two, and the crossbow has one. So now in this case, the crossbow has to beat my number of uh, black politicians in this case. So they have two behind their screen and then they're gonna discard those. Now, if they had here the black leader behind their screen, they can also say, okay, I've got this committed. So this guy, he's gotta be off the board, not on the table. So in this case, maybe he has this guy off the table and then these two, he discards that for a total of one, two, three, four there. So now it's four to two. Now, all I have to do is have two black tiles that I commit, or maybe just one and my leader. All I've got to do is equal that as a defender, but maybe I've got none of that happening. So I'm going to lose and get knocked out. So the winner, and tie goes to the defender in this case, the winner will kick out the matching leader color, and then they're going to score again a victory point of that color, whoever they knocked out. So that's an internal conflict, or what we like to call a revolt in the new editions of things. So that's a revolt. That's sort of a leader combat. Now, sometimes you can have a combat between two cities. So here's an example of what might uh, trigger a conflict between two cities. Now, it's, it's important to notice that you can't put a leader in that would connect these and make these one city if it would trigger a conflict. And this would trigger multiple conflicts because you can see now there would be two greens and two blues. So this is not a legal play here by the black player. Uh, but you can make a connection here with a tile. Now, when you do that, you immediately gonna say, okay, I put that, do we have a conflict? Yes, we do. If there's no conflict, you keep going about your business and maybe score the red victory point. But if you create any kind of conflict, you're gonna take this marker here and just put up just like that. So you're not worried about this tile for the time being. And then you're gonna look at both sides of the cities and see who's combating. So in this case, we have two conflicts. We've got two greens and we have two blues. And at the end of this conflict, uh, these cities theoretically are going to be joined. And again, you can't have the same color in there. So what we're concerned of when we do this type of combat is the red tile. So now it's one, two, three to one. And then starting to the player of the left of the person who put this down, anybody, doesn't matter if you're involved or not, can now discard red tiles or commit red leaders to either side. And it's possible that you have some stuff on both sides and you're conflicting with multiple players on either side. So you might want to figure out which side you want to win, which is more important to you. What do you have less victory points of? That kind of thing. So then you go around and then you will end up adding up 
the total of red tiles and red leaders that were committed. And then if it's a tie, then the player who placed this gets to choose which side wins. And then you're going to then uh, delete the leaders of the conflicting side. So let's say this side lost here. So this green one would go away. And so this guy here, whoever was the line player, would get a green victory point. Uh, this blue one would go away. And then the red cross player would get a blue victory point. And then you're going to remove red tiles from the losing side. So that one will go away. And actually in this effect, the cities actually won't even be joined once we're done with this. But this all happens sort of simultaneously. And I should say it is theoretically possible to have uh, multiple states uh, kind of in war at once as well, because obviously they're hexes, so you could put a tile that connects to two different things uh, at once. And so you're gonna, then you can resolve them, you know, you can commit tiles to any of those sides as well. So after that, uh, let's say we had done like so. So this one would go away, and then maybe this side spent two red tiles to sort of bring it up to a tie, and then, you know, let the guy choose. So then you're gonna add up each of these stacks, yeah. so and then maybe this, this side only contributed uh, or didn't contribute any in this case because we, again we had a tie. So then you would theoretically discard any that the winning side contributed off. And if that's not enough to match this number of tiles, then whoever initiated has to start discarding red tiles from that side. So that's a little bit of a different kind of thing. So even though you win, you might actually be losing some of your military strength that you sort of committed to that. And then once you're done, you pull this off and then you continue about your turn. So that's it. That second one sounds way more complicated than it is. The only thing is really kind of weird is that whole like losing red tile thing. Uh, but it's not bad once you play it a couple of times. And it's very, very different than how it works in Tigers and Euphrates, uh, because in that it's a whole other thing where you're picking and choosing, having separate combats with all the different leaders is a little bit more cleaner. But yeah. that's pretty much the gist of the game. I think I explained almost all the rules. <laughs> so let's go back to what I think. Okay, so that is Yellow and Yangtze. Uh, let's talk player count. Have not played this with two player. I don't know that I intend to play it with two player. I don't really like Tigers and Euphrates two player at all. Um, I don't imagine this would be any different. Uh, just because it's like two ships getting closer and closer as you're playing tiles and then, uh, okay, how many tiles does he have? Count, 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 conflict. Okay, I was right or off by one. Not really exciting at all to play at two players. Three and four players, I played this, both player counts. I, um, I don't know. Uh, I think I leaned towards four players, but the last time I played it, I played it a couple of times uh, at each player count. The last time I played it, we played with three and it was way fun. <laughs> it, was, it was a very uh, kind of epic fight and very close and lots of good combats and things. So I think uh, three players, is, is, is definitely good. I think it's good. I think four players will be better more often than three players because sometimes just the other time I played it with three players, it was sort of just flat and kind of had that thing where people kind of went off and did their own thing. Um, so it was one isn't exciting, but probably four is better. Still, I think three is good, and with people playing, kind of get to you know comfortable with the combat and the conflicts and stuff. Um, play time. What's the box say? Does ninety minutes? Yeah, that's probably fine. I think you could hit under that for sure, even with a four player game, as players become familiar with, you know, what you can do. And so I definitely don't think it'll go much more than 90, maybe a first play or something like that would. Um, and then in terms of what is the game like, well, it's like Tigers and Euphrates. <laughs> and if I try to think outside the box of Tigers and Euphrates in this game, I don't really know much games that are like it. Uh, just because of the whole conflict thing and the, ver the way you score victory points and the various kind of leader interactions and all that kind of stuff. There's not really, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's not really any game like these two games at all. Now sort of the elephant in the room would be which of these uh, do I like better? I don't know. I think, okay, so the cool thing about Tigers, let's talk about Tigers for a second. Now, Tigers had this thing where the wild cubes were on the board, they were called these treasures. There was no yellow cubes in Tigers. So once somebody connected those two city-states, because they were on each of the beginning kind of city tiles, if somebody connected them and they had the green merchant leader in one of those, uh, theoretically after a conflict, if there was any, they would grab that and they would get one of those very precious 
uh, wild tiles, uh, wild cubes behind their screen, of which there were not many. In this, of course, you have now a yellow temple or pagoda, and you have the ability of the yellow leader to go and collect the wilds. So it's possible, although there are there are much less of the yellow tiles um, in the bag. There's more black than everything else, and then. I think there's more red and then green and blue are the same and then there's very less uh, yellows. Uh, so, but you do have, you possibly have a more influx of the wilds there, which is interesting because I could see some people not liking that. I don't know. To me, that's a benign, there's no better or worse. It's just different in terms of that. And you're going to have, uh, you know, the different pagodas moving around. So you're going to have uh, more fights over that. Again, you can blow up the tiles easier to destroy that. Because once you build a monument in Tigris, you flip over the tiles and put this big honking thing on there. And then it kind of uh, then removes those colored tiles because you flip them over. And they're just there. They sit there. But these kind of bounce all over the place. So that's different. That's weird, right? Because you build this pagoda and then boop, it teleports over there. Which is, okay, that's fine. So I'm sitting here trying to think. Which one I like better, and I just I do, I just don't know. I, I think they're just so different from each other. I mean, they have the same DNA, like I talked about at the beginning, but the way that it plays out, where you can have multiple of those surgical strikes, you can do those little uh, farmer riot things, right? And just oh, I'm gonna delete that tile, and then oh, I'm gonna delete this tile, and then boom, your pagoda goes down, and then oh, I'm gonna move this pagoda here. So it's like bam, bam. It's just like little tactical strikes. Whereas in Tigris, it's more of a slow, like, you know, you build up sometimes for that big epic uh, battle that kind of just scatters everything to the wind. And that's neat. I like that in Tigris. And I like, like I said, the treasure thing in Tigris is I like the sort of the thematic concept of the treasures and sort of you're, you're extending, you're getting some kind of access to some resource or something that's very valuable here. But I also like how this has sort of that anchor on the yellow tiles and the yellow leaders and again, the Yellow Pagoda, that's just going to be a, a direct center for the conflict. And I want to say, like, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't certainly feel like it. But because they're both set in different cultures, I want to say, well, okay, that's why. Because there was something uh, indicative about this time period in uh, in ancient China versus the Middle East. But no, I don't. <laughs> there's nothing there. Like, there certainly isn't. I don't feel like there's any real like thematic significance here. Um, so on the thematic side, though, this does some interesting stuff. So I talked about the thematicness of kind of the big wars in Tigris and Euphrates and also of the treasure. Now here I like the special abilities of the different tiles. So when I build out those blues, I can just daisy chain them. So it's like the farm kind of snowballs. You get that sort of food resource. The green tiles, they're merchant tiles. So instead of getting the treasure, in this case, they allow you to go pick from the market. So that's really cool. And I like that you have sort of, you have your leader back. You've got your, like your special unit that you can com commit to the different types of conflict. And that's something you got to watch out for. So each of the different kind of colors in this case has some kind of little kind of, it's a little slight rule change, but it feels like a little slight kind of thematic twist to it. So that's an interesting kind of aspect to this. Um, and that's one thing that I've always kind of enjoyed about Tigers and Freddy's in this game is because they're so kind of abstract and uh, and each color sort of feels like a particular type of a civilization. It's like the black colors like your politicians and your blue ones are your farmers and your, and your resource gatherers. Your green ones are your merchants. Your red ones are your warriors and your soldiers. And then the yellow ones, I know that's kind of like your special sort of uh, maybe that's like your luxuries, like your jewelry or your gold or something. And maybe that's something that this one has that the other one doesn't have because you're trading in, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't really know much about the history here, but I could say more like the finer goods, like finer clothes or jewelry or something. And so maybe that was a very much a prevalent thing. That was prevalent in the Middle East too. I mean, that's prevalent everywhere. People like bling. Um, so I don't know, but each of those kind of has that cool kind of wrinkle. So even though you're playing a very, very abstract game, visually on the board, and this is in both games, you see these city-states, they grow and they shrink and there's combat and there's fights. And sometimes you might have a kind of a pumping economy of a certain color. So that kind of narrative arc 
in the game is there, even though it's so abstract. And I think that's why I really enjoy uh, these games. And one thing I haven't mentioned, I think when I did my top 100, Tigers and Euphrates was like number three on the list or something. Definitely in the top ten. Because I really, I mean, I'm just fascinated by that game. And the, like I talked about the narrative arc, it kind of plays itself out very differently uh, from game to game. Uh, just based on the tiles you get dealt and players going after different colors of victory points uh, at different times in the game. Because remember, whatever you have the least of is your score. So if you, uh, I think of in the last game, I think I had 12 green cubes like really early. And I was like, I don't need green for a long time. And my final score was 14. So at that point, I got two more green cubes. And then I spent the rest of the game, you know, obviously getting all of the other colors and the yellows. So based on kind of, you know, watching what everybody's going, what kind of cubes they're collecting, and you don't, I mean, you could write it down, but, you know, you kind of have to keep track of that. Um, So just the nature of that and the way that, you know, certain conflicts will happen and you can get involved in conflicts. That's another cool, interesting aspect of this is sort of everybody kind of in play in in, in a conflict and you being sort of involved in multiple but really only get to speak with the one voice of the red tiles in this case instead of playing the multiple colors like in tigris you really you have to commit to a side you can't just commit to a specific conflict um you know like these leaders and these leaders match you got to say this side wins or that side wins even though you have interest and uh you know in stuff that you want out of either side you've got to pick one and so that's a very interesting kind of cool thing incidentally i would love to see a game of thrones version of this type of system the complete aside there (laughs) because it does feel very sort of being manipulative at court and sort of try to drive the um the more kind of on the ground interests of where are the soldiers moving where are the trade routes extending where are the little farms you know growing on the rivers and so your leaders are like these little manipulators uh you know trying to get into each of the city states so it always feels like you're very much like kind of behind the scenes uh, leader and you have uh, you know, certain interests there, which is a, a weird thought to think about real history like that. But if you think of it in Game of Thrones, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, so it's a weird, quirky game. Both of these are really weird and quirky. If you had to choose one, let's say I have played neither, Joel, and which one should I choose first? I would say, I don't know, take a guess. I really like both. I'm going to be keeping this one, and I will be keeping Tigris and Euphrates as well. I don't know that I would ever choose uh, one over the other. Right now, I'm hot on this because it's new, and I haven't played it 100 times. So this one I'm all into. So Tigris is going to be sitting on the side for a long time, honestly. I After playing this, it's not like I'm saying, oh, well, I do think that other stuff in Tigris, like I talked about, is cool, and I kind of miss it, but I don't really miss it. So right now, this is the new hot thing on the block. And so I want to play this one, this one, this one, this one, uh, over Tigris all day long. But not because I feel like I'm going to get rid of Tigris or this is better or it beats it out. It just, it's kind of the same kind of vibe and it's different and that's new to me and I just want to play it. So I would say if you have never played either, then I don't know, flip a coin and pick one and play that for a year, right? And then come back and play the other one. Uh, if you've played a bunch of Tigris, I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of like nervous about that because there's a lot of, I don't know. I shouldn't be nervous because some people are like very uh, sentimental about their games and stuff. And they're like, hmm, this is not as good as this old game. You know, you know, people can be like that kind of. I don't really know if people are like that or if that's just the internet makes people like that. I don't really know. <laughs> so... I would say, yes, jump on this. You're going to love it. But there's going to be some random person that doesn't and really likes Tigris and has a big stick in the sand about it. So it's definitely really good. And I'm maybe I'm talking to like the other side of my brain <laughs> because I really like Tigris for the longest time. And I love that. Maybe that's who that other person is. Anyways, uh, I highly recommend this. If you don't have either, this is new and hot. You know, and people will probably be excited to play this, get this. But definitely go take a look at Tigris eventually. Uh, or vice versa. <laughs> Do it in the other order. I don't really know. They're both really good. I can't, I'm not going to decide. Okay. <laughs> Have a good time.